So this leads to questions about neoliberalism. But before I get there, can we talk about the nature of the American state? Because to me, as a you know, someone who read a lot of Weber, this suggests also a weak state. Um, and this, I think, is, is is a recurring theme in Mexican history, which with weak state might be too simple because there are elements of the state that are quite powerful. But what does this suggest about the nature of the Mexican state in the 1970s? Yeah, I mean, that's the, the, the question that haunts my research, and I'm going to die being haunted by that damn question. What is this? What is the Mexican state? I mean, it suggests a couple of things. It, it suggests that despite all the horrific things that it does in the 60s and 70s, it does have still a pretty important reservoir of popular support and legitimacy, particularly in the cities. So it, 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 in, in, in the middle classes that are really created as a consequence of this ISI economic program that really takes off um, uh, during and after World War II. But this idea that, that the PRI or this, the, the Mexican state was this, this corporatist structure that, that you know, emanated power, centralized in Mexico City and, and, and radiated it out to the countryside and to provincial cities in this all-powerful way is, is, is a myth, right? And the, the weaknesses of the Mexican state really refl- are reflected in the provinces in a place like Guerrero where they have to use you know, the, 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 the armor, the, the coercive, coercive aspect of the state to put down brutally – uh, uh, these guerrilla movements, right? Disappearing almost a thousand people from 1969 to 1975. Um, so it's, it's the, the combat answer, it's both strong and weak at the same time. There's also, if, if you, la- you want to look at it through the lens of, of drugs, I mean, th- something that happens in the 70s, particularly when we get to the end of the 70s, is that you start to see the entrance of federal players or federal institutional players into the drug trade. Right. And, and they're the ones who start to kind of centralize and rationalize the drug trade. And that's also going to have an impact in terms of what the state's going to look like, uh, because there, there, there will be such an intimate relationship between the security apparatuses and the military with like big time narco traffickers and, and eventually some of the organizations that we see emerge by the 1980s. So it, that's a, that I didn't give you that's a total cop out answer, but that, that's what no, I, I mean. That's, that's <laughs> the truth. Um, one of the things that you said to me in a previous interview that stuck with me is that the drug trade provided the liquidity that allowed the global capitalism to continue to function after the 2008 crash. Could, could you talk a little bit in the 1970s, the, the function that the drug trade is, is serving for Mexico, but also capitalism, both in North America and globally? Yeah, I think, I mean, this is just the beginning, right? So obviously it's, I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way, in certain segments of, of rural Mexico, particularly in Sinaloa, which is generally seen as like the cradle of these narco-trafficking organizations and big drug kingpins, there's work that, there's been some interesting work and in research that suggests that there, um, drugs and, and, and large-scale drug production beginning in the 40s and 50s allowed for the creation of like a, a narco-populist pact that kind of mitigated uh, local class conflict between small peasants and middling peasant farmers and larger landed elites that were able to withstand the agrarian reform efforts of the Mexican state that occurred in the 1930s. So drugs become a way of kind of negotiating class conflict in the countryside in a place like Sinaloa. I think that works because it's Sinaloa and because there is so much of this drug production already happening early on. I'm currently working on research for Guerrero in in a similar time area, and I, I don't know if I've discovered something similar. Um, but when you start to see that, I mean, there's people making a ton of money in the 1970s, but it's really not until the 80s, and it's with the, especially with the introduction of cocaine, where you see just like the strata, like the, the level of, of, of profit that, that's being made by people like, I guess, a friend of the pod, Rafael Caro Quintero, right? The guy who just got captured the other day. In the mid 80s, he's, pr- he's telling the Mexican government, look, like, let me, let me work in peace and I'll pay off your foreign debt. I mean, so there's a quantitative difference of like of, of revenue and profit that's being made in the 70s versus the 80s it's just like it's so much more money in the 80s and and you know there's there's some argument to be made that perhaps you know during mexico's lost decade the 80s were horrible economically we can talk about what happened in 82 but this drug money helped keep rural societies afloat to a certain extent um that and and undocumented migration to the u.s that really takes off in the 80s and by the, by the time we get, I think when I, when I made that comment, it was in reference to the crash in 2008, the recession, by that point is when you start to get, you know, profits up into the, the billions and the tens and 20, you know, the hundreds of billions of globally of drug money that, that some have suggested provided the necessary liquidity in, in during that moment of a credit crunch when the, the global economy was virtually stopped. But in terms of numbers, it's so different from like the 70s to like 2008, 2009, but it's starting to ramp up in the 70s. 
So it's interesting what you see is that basically it serves a local function of providing liquidity and then it probably goes national.